Hey, it's Seth. And Molly. And do we have news for you. Big Picture Science is now on Patreon. Patreon makes it easy for you to donate any amount to the radio show. So join us now, please, at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. And this is news for you because after choosing a monthly giving level, you can sit back, open a cold one, and reap the rewards. Because not only do you keep the radio show going, which is reward in itself, but each giving level comes with an extra perk. For example, you might get bonus content, the opportunity to participate in polls that will help guide future episodes, hearing your name read aloud during the credits, or even meet Seth virtually, that is. <laughs> I'm not sure you would want that, but here's the thing. Patreon makes supporting content you like, such as this radio show slash podcast, easy. For $5 a month, for example, you'll get exclusive content. And it's easy to sign up at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. I know because I just did it. And I can tell you the hardest bit of it was proving that you're not a robot. (laughs) I'm glad to hear that, Molly. Honestly, we appreciate your support. Because we couldn't do the show without you. Just mosey on over to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have a visitor to the studio who has brought visitors of her own. They're probably about the size of the last section of your pinky. And they're moving around and and waving their antennae around. And once in a while, they'll pull those antennae through their mouth parts, cleaning them. We reveal the identity of the speaker and her traveling companions. Coming up, I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, insects are the most numerous animals on Earth and vital to the ecosystem. We can do without mammals, but life depends on insects. Now research says that insects are disappearing. What's behind this mass vanishing act, plus how insects evolved in the first place? Also, the secret life of flies and an up-close visit with one of the most commonly maligned insects, and it hisses. Plus, are genetically engineered mosquitoes the way to stop malaria? This episode is The X-Flies. Some of you, the word insect is synonymous with pest. Beetles bug you, midges or nudges, and any six-legged wing critter is a clarion call for a swatter. Humans generally prefer cozying up to larger animals, those with fur and feathers, the charismatic fauna. Think about the ratio of cat videos to those of stink bugs. But bigger is not always better. It's just easier to see. Most mammals can be spotted without a magnifying glass, lending themselves to a simple census count, which is running to about 5,400 plus mammal species. The visibility of mammals is why I think we count sheep at night and not, say, mole crickets. Well, meanwhile, insect numbers rule. Entomologists estimate that there are 10 quintillion insects alive at any moment. And that, Seth, is... Uh, 10 to the 19th, that's a 1 followed by 19 zeros. <laughs> but we don't know if the actual species count for insects is really 91,000, to name a frequently cited number. The species count might be anything between 400,000 to the millions. When a single leaf provides you cover, well, you may be overlooked. Either way, we have a lot of insect buddies, so uh, why don't you kneel down and get to know our six-legged fellow earthlings? We're going to do that right now, and we picked a species that is perhaps the most challenging to love and appreciate. And they're here in the studio, and they're accompanied by a human chaperone. Hello, I'm Lauren Esposito, and I'm the Schlinger Curator of Arachnology at the California Academy of Sciences. I have sitting in front of me a little clear plastic critter keeper, and inside is a few pieces of an old egg carton And sitting on that egg carton is a number of things that some people might call creepy crawlies. Laura, now your specialty are arachnids, but you're willing to discuss cockroaches with us today. Sure. And these are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. They're from the island of Madagascar. 
Two of those are particularly large. One of them is probably about the size of a big thumb, an adult thumb, and it's glossy and dark brown. I would say like a stained chestnut. And it has two horns on its head, and all the little ones in there are their babies. They were probably hatched out from their egg case a few months ago. If I had to guess, I would say they're two months old. So they're babies. Now, you said they might be a couple of months old. What is the lifetime for a cockroach? Well, you know, many cockroaches, especially the ones that live in our human habitations, have really short generation time. So the adults can lay eggs, and those eggs can hatch out and become adults and lay eggs of their own in probably just a few weeks. So that's how the populations grow so quickly, and we have come to hate them so much. Well, Lauren Esposito and her cockroaches will stay with us. Is that right? You're willing to do that? Yeah, sure. Okay. We're going to discuss another insect that is also maligned, but who has a passionate defender. The Secret Life of Flies is entomologist Erica McAllister's book about the marvelous exploits of the order Diptera. She is senior curator of Diptera in the Department of Entomology at the Natural History Museum in London, and she gives us the buzz about the remarkable diversity and adaptiveness of one of the few animals whose name also describes its movement. Erica, I'm going to start with a question I've had about flies ever since I came across a housefly. Do houseflies know that I'm trying to catch them? Yes. The way that flies see, actually, if you're going at a normal speed to approach the fly, they can see you as quite a a moving object and you're a threat to them. So they will definitely move out the way. They've done some brilliant research recently looking at the evasive actions of flies. But if you do want to catch fly, I'm not advocating that you kill flies, by the way, just catch them, it's a little party trick. Go very, very slowly because then they no longer perceive you as a threat. You are almost like a solid object. So you can actually cup (laughs) them in your hands and remove them. Okay, so they can see me coming. I thought you were going to say they can sense me, but they're using their eyes. They can smell you. They can (laughs) They can see you. You are quite a large object in comparison to them. You're quite a smelly object. No offense, but you're (laughs) quite a smelly object in comparison to them. You're making lots of noise. So, yes, you're not being very subtle towards a fly. And their movements in the air, they're like acrobats or something, the way that they can move and dodge out of the way. Yeah, no, no, they're absolutely fantastic. They have just been speaking to a professor about this recently, and we're looking at the flies and the mechanics behind it to help us with fighter jet planes. So fighter jets have all these supercomputers to help them move very quickly in response, whereas flies do this innately. They do it with such high precision. They can yaw, they can roll, they can fly backwards, they can do all sorts of stuff. They're amazing flyers. They can fly backwards? Some of them, they can just kind of go whoop, so they can kind of fly up. You can't obviously see my hands because I'm doing the (laughs) fly motion myself. They're just kind of reversing quickly, as it were, out of the situation. Goodness. Now, how many different kinds of flies are there? Describe species. We have about 160,000 species at the moment. So they're in the top four of the largest groups of animals on the planet. But undescribed, we know that we're completely underestimating the real number that is out there. So take, for example, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, there's many different species, but we can't separate them on what they look like. We know that they may have different behaviours. Now, does this make a new species? Does it not? But now we're using our molecular tools. We're looking at the DNA. We're understanding the genomes. We're going to be able to actually go there and properly describe a lot of these species. Now, you just dropped that the mosquito is a kind of fly. Not everyone knows. knows? I certainly didn't know that. No, and I realised I'd failed, or science communication had failed, when my mum went to go, oh, Erica, you're doing mosquitoes and flies. And I was like, wow, we really haven't communicated ourselves well at times. Yes, they are a type of fly. They're a very popular fly, though they're a much maligned fly. This is the problem with some common names, is like dragonflies, mayflies. They're actually not flies. To be a true fly, the diptera, the basic... Now, the thing is, flies laugh at you because they, they're not all of them do exactly what I say, so that's the problem. Is the one pair of wings, is the hortes, the balancing organs, and the sucktorial mouth parts. Uh, so, again, so there's the, flies, the, however. The, the balancing organs? What are those? Yeah, they're, 
They're the two little knob-like structures that poke out behind the wings. And they are what enables it to do all this amazing flying. They're the ones that are able to do sensory perception. So when it, it tips and it yawls and it rolls and all these things, these are really important organs to help stabilise it, along with the eyes and other things, but yeah. Now, you love flies, which is obvious to anyone who's heard you speak about flies, just <laughs> your enthusiasm and your energy. Can you describe for us why you do love flies and you sometimes what? identify with them? <laughs> yeah, they just do everything. They get everywhere. They're, they're just... Anyone could ask a question about the environment and you can find a fly that can give you the answer. They feed on everything, every sort of ecological process, they're, they're just there. And then, then they do all sorts of funky stuff that you just wouldn't expect. They dive in lakes. Um, you get marine flies. You get ones that live in the Arctic. There's bioluminescent flies. There's venomous flies. They're just amazingly diverse. Their morphology is, is so amazing, both as adults and larvae. I love just learning so much that every time you think you've kind of learn as much as you can know you're just like oh every day there's something more and more and more and they're so great and challenging now you named some of the categories of flies and your book indeed breaks down into chapters of what could be described as fly occupations oh, yeah. but but let's look at one crucial job and and you said that mosquitoes do it which is another surprise which is pollination i've learned that one thing you don't like to eat is <laughs> chocolate Okay, so I can't that, stand it. All right. That is a subject Sorry. for another discussion. But we would not have chocolate without flies. Well, um, there are some other pollinators we've found now, but the, the biggest, the largest majority of pollinators of chocolate are these tiny, tiny midges. And these midges are from the family, the biting midges. So you, a lot of people would have come into contact with these midges as the Americans, you call them noceums. So you'd be out for a walk and you're suddenly attacked by these tiny little flies drawing blood. But the, it is only the females doing that because the males, they are vegetarian. They are the nectar feeders, the pollen feeders. And the chocolate, I describe the flower, it's basically like the panda of the plant world. It's terrible at reproducing. It has a really naturally low rate of reproduction, but it needs these tiny, tiny little flies to go into it to be able to pollinate it. So all the big pollinators can't do it. It's these tiny, minuscule ones that do it. So the chocolate midge is a beautifully tiny little male. He's got these most amazing plumos antennae. He's quite a fluffy individual. And we don't think about flies as being very important pollinators and so one of the reasons of doing the book it was to actually say look actually there's a lot of things that flies are crucial for pollinating and we've got to start thinking about them as well now another job that that the flies take on is coprophagy and the flies that um, engage in this will not be out of a job anytime soon erica no, where and- would the world be without coprophagies it, it would be a very, very um, <laughs> rancid place. Um, and why, why, that is everyone, that? why is that? Why is that? So coprophagy is obviously the eating of feces, the eating of poo. <laughs> and it's the thing that everyone goes, that's disgusting, flies are revolting. But it's like, hold on a minute, take a step back. Can you imagine if they didn't? Can you imagine how much animal waste, and I'm including humans in that, is produced every day? And if we didn't have these flies going around cleaning it up, can you imagine what a quagmire it would just be? We would be swimming around in thesis. <laughs> and that, I'm sorry, doesn't sound pleasant to me at all. Well, what are they doing? Are they eating the poo? And then if they are, aren't they also defecating? And don't you have an endless cycle? Or are they doing something else with it? <laughs> They just have very, very small poos. They're laying their eggs in it, so a lot of the larval stages. So a lot of people would have heard of dung beetles, but there's quite a few groups of dung flies. And you can have loads of these larvae just eating away. Because feces is, and I'm not advocating we humans do it, but it is quite nutrient-rich. I was surprised to learn that the New Zealand bat fly, which (gasps) runs up and down the fur of bats, is in the category of the coprophage. Yeah, they've been looking at the gut analysis of these now and realised it's feeding on the bat faeces rather than the bats. Well, why is it in their fur? But it's in their fur. 
They say it's a very warm, nice, protective environment. So they live on the fur and then they fly down to the guano and feed off the and guano? And their larvae live in the guano as I well. I see. And if you see, you have beautiful pictures in this book, I have to say. It is a lovely book. And you have close-ups of these flies. And in the case of the New Zealand bat fly, it has claws on the end of its <laughs> legs for gripping. Yes. I mean, they're, they're completely adapted. They're amazing. So all of the species, though, the ectoparasites, the ones living externally on the bats, the birds, etc., they've all got these amazing claws on their legs. They're completely suited for the habitat that they're living in. You have brought me around to appreciating the beauty of the fly, and that's a remarkable thing to do for your <laughs> readers. It really is. They are beautiful. They, they truly are, and some of them have quite elegant forms. Now, we think of the housefly, and maybe we're prejudiced against the housefly, but I'm thinking now of the photos you have of the crane fly and its long, slender legs, just exquisite. Yes. The crane flies, I mean, I love them. Um, they are so... And they're the, and the group of flies that are all these long-legged, uh, very delicate, very thin. Um, crane flies spend a lot of time on tusks of grass, so they, they wave and wobble in the wind quite a bit. I wonder if we could talk about the proboscis. Yes. Okay, good. The uh, sectorial mouth part. <laughs> yes. Now, some of these on the different flies, again, it, it varies. Uh, some are quite long, others are shorter. <laughs> and that's fascinating in itself. But if you look at what's at the end of um, this feature, well, why don't you describe what's at the end of a proboscis? Well, a lot of them have got tiny serrated teeth. Say, for example, a mosquito, when the female is coming in to launch and she stabs you with her proboscis, these serrated teeth are the ones that gently cut through your flesh. The um, proboscis of the stable fly, I mean, it's just, when you see the, the finite detail of the teeth on that, it's lethal and you can understand why this fly really does hurt you because it just shreds at your flesh. <laughs> now, a mosquito falls under the, your category of a sanguivore because it's a blood yes. sucker. Okay. Not a predator. And maybe an example of a predator is the fly that can take out a hummingbird in flight. Can it do it in yeah, flight? Yeah, that's my, my ultimate fly. I, I'm wearing a necklace of that fly right You're now. Kidding. No, I, I adore that fly. The stories are so brilliant uh, of a twitcher watching these beautiful, delicate hummingbirds and you can see it. And then you can almost feel that this thug of a fly just comes along, grabs it, paralyzes it and shreds it. And I have this image of this male's face absolutely gasped with horror. <laughs> and this little fly is like, yep, I'm just taking out the birds. And I'm like, wow. I mean, the idea of flies taking on vertebrates and predating on vertebrates. It's just, you know, we think about the size of flies. This is incredible. So this fly is not the size of a hummingbird. No, it's uh, a little smaller. I mean, these aren't the biggest of hummingbirds, but um, yes, it would still... I mean, I have them in the collection, and the, the flies, these this whole group, they're the robber flies or assassin flies because they are the aerial predators. They are the beasts of the airways, and they can take on things so much larger than themselves. We have a fly, and it's taken on a grasshopper that is three times its size. It's amazing. Erica McAllister, thank you so much for speaking with us about the world of flies. <laughs> thank you. Erica McAllister is an entomologist at the Natural History Museum in London and the author of The Secret Life of Flies. Lauren Esposito is still with us in studio. Seth, you're willing to take a close look at these cockroaches? Well, uh, I'm certainly willing. I don't know if they're willing to take a close look at me. Now, the adult cockroaches are just sitting there, and the babies are waving. They're waving their antennae around, and the antennae look like they're almost the length of their bodies. Yeah, they have really long antennae that they use for smelling. So they're, those antennae are covered in all kinds of sensory hairs, and those hairs actually pick up chemical signals. So they can communicate with each other by releasing pheromones, which are airborne chemical signals, and then picking up those chemical signals with their antennae. Seth, you are not flapped. You are unflappable when it comes to looking at cockroaches. Well, there's three sixteenths of an inch of plastic between me and this cockroach family.
Coming up, Molly and I will continue to admire the undoubted attributes of our cockroach visitors. Meanwhile, how insects evolved in the first place and why some populations are in decline. Then later in the show, changing the genome of the mosquito to combat malaria. It's the X-Flies on Big Picture Science. Hi, it's me again, reminding you that Big Picture Science is now on Patreon. So if you join now, you can become a dolphin. That's right. I mean, it makes perfect sense, particularly if you like fish. If you give $20 a month, you become a dolphin. And if what Seth and I are talking about isn't intuitive, well, find out what we're talking about at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. But what if I want a little more fang for the buck, Molly? Can I become a, a velociraptor? Yes, you can, Seth. I didn't know that they had fangs. <laughs> well, most of them don't, but, you know, some have had dental work. Well, for $10 a month, you can be a velociraptor. $5 a month grants you the title of tardigrade. It's pretty simple, really. And how would you compare the benefits of being a velociraptor versus a tardigrade versus a dolphin? Well, <laughs> well, the benefits, two of them are still around. But when it comes to Patreon, there are different rewards at different amounts. So if you become any of them, for example, you get bonus material, which is exclusive to Patreon supporters. But go to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and find out what the other benefits are. Okay, but is there a minimum amount? Well, for $2 a month, you get the satisfaction of knowing that you keep the mics on at Big Picture Science and you get to participate in polls. Those supporters must be protozoa, elementary life, or, or maybe just the first life. That's right, protozoa. But whatever you can spare each month, it helps us out a lot, and we are grateful. So please head over to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and sign up. It's easy, it's fun, and best of all, it keeps Big Picture Science going. So thank you. I, I've always wanted to be a velociraptor. Well, you can be, Seth, at $10 a month. <laughs> Just go to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. The cockroaches in the studio with us are old. I mean, well, these guys in particular are not so old, but the species is pretty ancient going back to some of the first insects on Earth. We're in the studio with Lauren Esposito from the California Academy of Sciences, who is willing to discuss cockroaches with us, and she's brought some into the studio. You know, these are among the first critters probably on land, right? Well, insects probably weren't the first arthropods on land, so the first things that had an exoskeleton and could walk around in fact, arachnids, things like scorpions and spiders, predate insects. But insects are certainly have been on Earth, walking on land, for at least 350 million years. Now, you may have traced your family tree back a few generations. The insect family tree goes back 400 million years, and cockroaches are some of the earliest insects to appear. In the last few years, scientists have produced the first ever comprehensive evolutionary tree of insects. The phylogenetic tree details relationships of the mind-boggling diversity. One contributor to that evolutionary tree was evolutionary biologist and entomologist Jessica Ware from Rutgers University, Newark, whose area of expertise is cockroaches, dragonflies, and damselflies. And she says that entomologists are nowhere near completing an exhaustive study of all the insects on Earth. And now we may not have a chance to do so before species disappear. You are probably familiar with the plight of the flight of the bumblebee. Bumblebee populations have been in decline, and for the first time, a bumblebee has been put on the endangered species list. But the recent study carried out in nature preserves over 27 years by German researchers found a major decline in all flying insects. Now, the insects were measured by, by weight, and the collective biomass fell by 77%. And in the summer, when insects are the most numerous, by 82%. Dr. Ware reminds us that the members of the following list, which are just a tiny fraction of all insects, are animals we cannot live without. So let us give you, for starters, the beetle, the bee, the butterfly, ladybugs, bedbugs, praying mantis, aphids, earwigs, crickets, dragonflies, stink bugs, and kissing bugs. What do they all have in common? They're all members of the class Insecta, the most diverse group of organisms on the planet. 
I see. Okay, now, you were part of a team of about 100 scientists that helped to map the evolution of insects a few years ago, and the result being the first phylogenetic tree of insects, that is a tree showing evolutionary relationships. Okay, well, what was the first insect? How far back do these guys go? Well, we know that winged insects are about 406 million years old, and they probably looked something like a dragonfly. Maybe they were larger than the dragonflies we see today, but they probably looked something like that. Okay, so what niche did insects fill? I mean, that's a long time ago, 400 million years ago. I mean, that predates the dinos and so forth. Uh, they, They must have seen an opportunity. There must be some, I don't know, evolutionary niche that wasn't so niche for this kind of a of an animal. Well, certainly the first things to take to the skies were insects. So before insects started flying around up there, there was nothing there. There were no birds, there were no bats, there were no pterosaurs. So that's a wide open niche space to exploit. And then most of the terrestrial habitat had not yet been exploited by other animals yet. So insects were able to fill basically all of the terrestrial niches and the air. They're also small, at least they seem to be small today. Have they always been quite so small? No. In fact, some of the ancient relatives to modern insects and modern arachnids were much larger. There were some scorpions that were the size of a terrier. There were these things that were close relatives to modern dragonflies, but not actually modern dragonflies. And they had wingspans of each wing was about 37 centimeters, uh, which is about three feet long. So that's, those are big to have those flying around above you. My goodness, that sounds scary. So I've heard it said that insects can only get so big because they don't breathe through a nose or their mouth or anything like that. They breathe through these little holes in their their hard outer skeletons. And consequently, if you make them too big, then it's you know too far from the air to go into these bodies. Is that the deal? What limits their size? Well, certainly the spiracles, which are the organs you're talking about, these little holes in the side of their body, which through air enters the body, and their circulatory system is pretty uh, rudimentary, so it's very hard to have them be extremely large and to be able to be fast, um, to be able to do things that require a lot of oxygen transport and a lot of blood transport. But in addition, the larger you are, the easier it is for you to dry out um, if you have a large surface area. And insects that have just soft bodies, a lot of them have just soft bodies, they would dry out very quickly. So a lot of the times when we imagine what these giant things must have looked like during the Carboniferous period, they weren't necessarily the fast flying quick-turning dragonflies that we see today. They would have been kind of slow-moving, kind of with wings that paddled through thick, viscous air, (laughs) almost like paddling a canoe through water. Um, And they would have been probably pretty clumsy. But certainly, as birds came on the scene, we see dragonflies modified the way that their wings are shaped and the way that they fly. They suddenly got very good at getting away very quickly. (laughs) And presumably that had to do with the pressure of predation, but also with the fact that they had birds competing with them for the other insects that they were eating. When did insects first start to fly? Did the first insects fly or were they just, you know, relatively lightweight and they could, you know, hop big distances and eventually started, I don't know, flailing their legs? How did that happen? Oh, that's a hot debate. (laughs) In the entomology world, how insects first started to fly is a really hot debate. And different things have been proposed from starting to glide slowly, from hopping around, from insects that have aquatic life stages, that have gills on their abdomens that may have been modified to be wing-like. People have debated about this for decades. But what we know is that there are insects that we call the basal hexapods, and they are insects that do not have wings. They arose, they first speciated before the first flying insects, Um, and they all are very small-bodied. Most of them live under the soil, and they don't have a lot of, uh, well, they're not very charismatic, put it that way, Um, (laughs) and they're not very colorful, kind of drab-looking. There's not very many species present in those taxa. Once insects evolved wings. Once the winged kind of body type evolved, from that point onwards, that's when we really see insects rise to being the dominant, you know, species that we know of when we think about biodiversity. Well, Lauren Esposito from the California Academy of Science is is here in the studio with us and with a bunch of cockroaches in a, uh, what I hope is a well-sealed container. As (laughs) as we look at these insects up close, at these uh, little roaches scurrying around here, Is there anything that we should pay attention to that will perhaps help us appreciate it somewhat better? 
Well, when we think about cockroaches, we always think of them as being really vile and dirty. Um, but what you might notice when you look at the cockroaches is that they spend a lot of time cleaning. So they'll see that they'll take their antennae and they'll drag it, you know, over their mouth parts, holding it with their feet. Um, their tarsi. And what they're doing is actually keep their antennae very clean so that that way they can use their antennae to kind of sense around. There's 4,500 species of true cockroaches plus another 2,900 that are termites. 2% of those are pests. The rest of them live fantastic lives out in the jungle or in the forest, um, really not carrying a lot of disease as far as we know. It's just those 2% that are living in the sewer that kind of give the rest of the cockroaches the bad name of them being kind of dirty. Jessica, something is happening to flying insects. I believe the alarm started in earnest with a German study released in 2017 that found that over the course of nearly 30 years, there'd been a major decline in flying insects in one region. Now, uh, can you tell us about this study? What's going on here? This study was a really interesting study that harnessed something that we all have access to, citizen science data. So they used citizen science data that had collected insects, you know, doing bio blitzes and different things like that, and they weighed the mass of insects that were collected each year in these different sites in Germany. And what they found was that the overall mass of insects that they were collecting was decreasing over time. And what that could suggest is that insects are getting smaller, but it could also suggest that there's fewer insects in general that are being collected despite the same amount of human effort. That's alarming because what we've noticed is beyond that study, in monarchs, number of monarchs that are showing up at their migration habitats are also decreasing. Number of mosquitoes are decreasing. So it's a trend that we're seeing in many different studies for many different groups of insects. The number of individuals is going down. What's the theory about What's going on here? I mean, uh, bumblebees began to decline in 2017, apparently. Bumblebees were placed on the endangered species list for the first time. I, I take it that's not related to the other kind of bees that have been declining, the collapse of the honeybees. Well, in general, a lot of the factors that are causing, you know, these different insect groups to decline are similar. So loss of habitat is something that is common for all of these insects that we're talking about. The use of neonicotinoid insecticides has been implicated for bees, but those neonicotinoid insecticides, which linger in the environment, can also affect different types of insects, right? From butterflies, like monarchs, to other types of insects. And in addition, the climate has been changing. So we've seen erratic, you know, variable seasons where seasons end up being drier or wetter than what is normally expected for that time of year. And all of these factors together creating these urban deserts by having, you know, a reduction in, in habitat, having the habitat be poorer in terms of the quality of plants that are there, the presence of insecticides and the unseasonable weather, all of these things combined can dramatically affect whether or not insects survive to reproduce and lay their eggs so that they can have progeny the next year. Well, finally, Jessica, I, I know this is probably an impossible question to answer. Nonetheless, I will ask it of you, and that is, can you envision what life would be like in a world without insects? I mean, if, if all the insects were to go away, what would life be like on Earth? Well, for humans, it would be pretty much uninhabitable. When you think about it, you know, in our day-to-day -day life, we obviously know that we rely on insects for pollination and for food. So we would imagine a future without fruit, without coffee, without blueberries. You know, those things, I think, have already been well covered by the media. But there's other things that we rely on insects for that we kind of take for granted. So heaven forbid we talk about death, but death is something that comes for all organisms on Earth. And there's insects that do a service that are decomposers that basically decompose all of the dead things, whether it be dead trees, dead plants, and dead bodies. Without insects, those bodies would not decompose. They would decompose at a very slow rate, perhaps just by fungus and microbial decomposition. That would be very, very slow. So we would have kind of littered carcasses of plants and trees and animals all around without insects to do that work. As well, you know, without insects, they're the main food source for a lot of birds, for a lot of bats. So if you imagine a world without insects, you imagine a world without birds. You imagine a world without bats. You imagine a world without lots of organisms that rely on insects as food. So the type of habitat that you would picture would be one that would be very different in terms of the types of 
plants that would be able to survive and the types of animals that would be able to survive. We certainly would not. Jessica Ware, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Jessica Ware is an evolutionary biologist and entomologist at Rutgers University, Newark. Lauren, where did these cockroaches come from that we have here in the studio? Well, these particular ones came from a colleague's apartment uh, where they normally live in the bedroom of her children. What? Yeah. But in a container or they were running around the house? Usually they're in a container. Because these species were originally from Madagascar, they're really incapable of surviving outside of a human house. They need it warm, they need a food supply. So these ones normally live in a cage and they sleep on the shelf of a 11-year-old girl. Can we we touch the cockroaches? Yeah, sure, we can pick one up and and take it out and we might get lucky and be able to hear it hiss. These guys, they don't know what's about to happen to them, but then again, either do I. Okay, so Lauren is opening the cage. Opening the lid. Oh, goodness. Blow the lid off this this show, okay? All right, I got my hand out. It's just like Halloween, except they're going to put a bug in it. Did you hear that hiss? Wait a minute. It It sounds like air leaving a balloon. That's kind of the idea. They're pushing this air out of their spiracles, which are their lung openings, and it's meant to ward off predators. Little cockroach buddy. It really is hissing. Is it is it hissing because it's mad? I would say scared. Okay. Oh, he's incredible. The, The legs feel like they're strong. It's kind of tickly. He's actually quite gentle. He looks like he's a little afraid, which he is. Is this the heat? That is the heat, yeah. I never thought I would hold a cockroach willingly. And look at him. This shell is really extraordinary on the back of this cockroach. What can you say about it? So these cockroaches, they're really like a a rich chestnut fading into black color. and, And it's really shiny, thick shell. Shell's an accurate word to describe them. They're related to crustaceans like shrimp and and lobsters that we consider to have a shell. And he's perfect for blending in. And and he's got this armor, this leathery armor to keep things from eating him, to keep him protected. And what do you think he's gathering about being on the palm of my hand? First of all, it's quite bright, but is he picking up chemical signals from my skin? Sure, he's he's definitely smelling the environment um, using his antennae, and he's also feeling with those same antennae. So he's he's just trying to figure out where he is. It's kind of an unusual circumstance to be held by another thing. <laughs> Let me give him back to you. Lauren, are you willing to hang on a little bit longer? Absolutely. Okay, and are the cockroaches happy? As happy as they can be, I suppose. Can you tell when they're not? Well, they start hissing. Coming up, high-tech tools may provide an efficient way of getting rid of malaria. But are we ready to actually tweak the genome of the mosquito to do it, using CRISPR and gene drives to rid ourselves of a deadly pest? It's the X-Flies on Big Picture Science. appreciating the diversity and evolutionary adaptations of insects, including the hissing cockroaches that are right next to me here and who are auditioning for a part in the show. Insects are indispensable to our ecosystem and their disappearance is alarming. However, there is one species that might be universally voted off the island. Mosquitoes do have ecological niches as pollinators and as a source of food for birds and reptiles. But more than any other insect, they are notorious vectors of disease. The mosquito is small enough to perch on your fingernail, yet no insect species has been a more efficient killer of humans. The mosquito species Itis aegypti can carry yellow fever virus, dengue, and Zika. Many mosquito-borne diseases are caused by viruses. Malaria, however, is caused by a one-celled parasite and is carried by 40 species of the mosquito genus Anopheles. A person who falls ill with malaria may feel like they have the flu, but left untreated, the illness can lead to complications and death. According to the Centers for Disease Control, in 2016, there were 216 million cases of malaria worldwide, and almost half a million people died, mostly children. 
scientists are applying high-tech tools to fighting the disease. This includes the new gene editing technique CRISPR, which allows for precise and rapid edits, combined with gene drives, which greatly increase the chance that genetic modifications are inherited over and over. Hi, this is Anthony James. I'm a vector biologist working at the University of California, Irvine, and I work with mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases. His team's focus is the Anopheles gambiae mosquito, which carry not all but a large number of the deadly diseases. However, with CRISPR and gene drive technology, unforeseen consequences are a concern, and so are those anticipated. Could engineered mosquitoes create parasites or gene drives that are resistant to the modification? Dr. James describes where the deadly parasite calls home. It turns out that the parasite can only be one of two places. It can only be in the mosquito or in the human being. The parasites feed on human red blood cells, and when the mosquito takes a meal looking for that protein-rich meal to make her eggs, uh, she takes up the blood with the parasites and picks them up at that point. All right, Tony, so CRISPR, that's a genetic engineering tool, allows you to make quick and uh, precise edits in a genome. Which uh, part of the genome are you targeting in your battle against these malaria-causing mosquitoes? So we're not actually editing the mosquito genome per se. What we're doing is we're using the technology to bring in a brand new gene. And this new gene has the ability that when it's, when it's turned on and working, of actually being able essentially to kill the parasites. So you're making mosquitoes, in other words, that have the ability to kill the parasite if, if the mosquito bites somebody who's infected. Uh, how, how does it do that, actually? It turns out that there are a lot of different of these malaria parasites. And for example, the ones that infect humans will not infect mice. So people working on vaccines were able to put human parasites into mice, and mice would fight them off. And we took a part of the mouse immune system that is able to kill the human parasites and put those into mosquitoes. These modified mosquitoes would have part of a mouse's immune system. Correct. Just a tiny little part, uh, one or two genes at most. I see. So to be clear then, the genetic modification is not to eliminate the mosquito. The mosquito probably doesn't know what's happened to it, probably doesn't feel that anything's happened to it, but it's targeting the plasmodium that causes malaria. That is correct. And so our idea is that it's going to be probably impossible to get rid of all the mosquitoes. And so we say, well, it's the parasite that's a target. So we use the mosquitoes to go after the parasite. The World Health Organization says that increased prevention and control measures already in place have led to a nearly 30 percent reduction in malaria mortality rates since 2010. In other words, we do seem to be moving in the right direction, and this might be used as an argument that current control measures, which include, you know, maybe vaccines or, in any case, better mosquito nets, are working. Why do we need a genetic engineering approach? So that's a great point, and it turns out that if you look at the data, that is correct. Over the past uh, 10 to 15 years, there's been a really remarkable and, and laudable reduction in the amount of malaria. However, we've seen over the last couple of years that we've bottomed out, so to speak. Uh, it's not getting any better, so we still need techniques to push this all the way to zero. Gene drives. Gene drives, that's a scheme made possible, I take it, by the CRISPR technique how does a gene drive work, and how do they ensure that, uh, you know, anything that you modify, its descendants are still subject to that modification? Right. So this is a, an interesting question to try to answer over the radio because I usually wave my hands around. But the idea is that there's a technology, which is a CRISPR technology, that allows you to break chromosomes. And when the chromosomes are broken, they try to repair themselves. And so what we do is we use the CRISPR technology to break the chromosomes at a very specific place, and then we add a whole bunch of DNA and hope that in the process of the DNA fixing itself, it copies some of the DNA that we put in. So we can actually make that happen. And when we do that, this process becomes repeatable. And so what we put in has the ability also to continue to cut the chromosomes and add things in. This isn't like changing a trait for the next generation, is it? I mean, if you could modify my genome so any kids I'd have would be blondes, that modification would be washed out a few generations down the line. That's obviously not happening in a gene drive. No. So the idea is to have it persist in the mosquitoes for, say, five to eight years, long enough to have an impact on malaria. But we're not looking for an evolutionary change, you know, something that's going to be around for 10,000 years or something like that. 
when you use this gene drive, okay, you, you modify the DNA of a whole bunch of mosquitoes in the labs, but this isn't like the technique where you, I don't know, sterilize all the males and hope that they mate with a lot of the females. I mean, that gets washed out. This obviously doesn't get washed out because it gets passed down from generation to generation. How does that work? The idea is to have the gene drive system put into what's called the germline. So these are the sperm and the eggs, and those are the cells that contribute to the next generation. So we see that everywhere. It's the same thing in humans. They have sperm and eggs, and a sperm fertilizes an egg and gives rise to a new individual. So if our genes are in the sperm or the eggs, then the offspring that come from that will have the gene, and it'll just continue that way. So it'll be something that is heritable over hopefully at least five to eight years. So in some sense, you've actually made a, I don't know, a new species of mosquito. Well, you think about it like adding two or three additional genes. And so it's, it's not a different species because there are natural variants of malaria vectors, of malaria mosquitoes that, that are resistant. They have their own genes that help them fight them off. But it's hard for us to work with those. And so we just made some essentially synthetic genes and put those in. Okay, designer mosquitoes. You've got it. Okay, Tony, well, give me the big picture of how this would work, uh, assuming all goes well. You're going to engineer some mosquitoes in the lab, uh, breed some nominal number of them. I don't, I don't know what that number might be. I mean, 10, 1,000, a million, and then release them into the wild, right? That's correct. The idea would be that they would be part of an integrated program. Hopefully, we have people using bed nets uh, and availability of prophylactic drugs and maybe down the line a vaccine. But what we offer is a circumstance where we put the mosquitoes out there and malaria is eliminated from that area. It can't move back in. And it can't move back in because if somebody brings in the parasites, the local mosquitoes are unable to transmit. So what it allows us to do is consolidate our efforts. We can clear an area and have it remain free of malaria and move on to the next place. And so our big contribution is the sustainable aspect, sustainable consolidation of, of elimination of malaria. I see. How, how many mosquitoes do you need to, to breed in order to do this effectively out in the wild, not in the lab? Amazingly, it's not as many as you think. We imagine that individual releases will be in the somewhere in the range of 100,000. And we easily have 100,000 mosquitoes and many more actually growing in our insectary right now here at UC Irvine. So the idea would be probably you'd be using millions over a year, but it's easy to make that many. <laughs> mosquitoes are easy to make, I, I take Well, it. you just give them something to eat, and then the next thing you know, you got a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, about some concerns here. This technique uh, yes. might work in the lab, but there are questions about its effectiveness in the wild. One of the big challenges seems to be the potential that the insects will develop a resistance to gene drives or that maybe the parasite would develop a resistance to the uh, altered mosquito. Correct. And so for the parasite, um, it's very much like a multiple drug use. So we, we have agents now, for example, that will cause infections in people and are resistant to antibiotics. And so what the physician will do will prescribe an, a combination of antibiotics. So the idea is that if one doesn't get him, the other will. And so we do the same thing putting these genes in the mosquito. We have at least two genes that go after the parasite. But then for the mosquito becoming resistant to it, the good news about the CRISPR technology is that if a particular region in the chromosome is resistant to our genes, we just go to another place. And so we can overlap places where we go so we get complete coverage, even though in, in one individual mosquito, it may have one resistance gene. This sounds like the kind of cocktails that are made in diseases. Yes, that is exactly right. And that's the idea is that you have multiple systems built in backups, so to speak. Another concern, Tony, is that of unforeseen consequences. I think every time you talk about modifying biology somewhere, you know, a lot of people get up in arms, you know, you, you know remember the rabbits in Australia or something. Right. I mean, how can we be certain that changing this gene that stops the transmission of the malaria parasite won't also alter, I don't know, the mosquito's behavior? What if, what if uh, the gene has other adaptive functions, you know, or, or even worse, the gene triggers a cascade of troubling ecological consequences? So we can never really know without testing whether or not these things are going to happen. But we can make really educated guesses. And indeed, because it's a genetic engineering, we can structure these DNA molecules that we put in in a way that they have the minimum amount of what we would call off-target impact. And so part of our strategy of developing something for the field is to minimize uh, the potential for these off-target effects. Well, finally, Tony... If we succeed in wiping out the malaria parasite, 
will we then be able to find it in our hearts to like mosquitoes? I think we're going to have issues still because while we may have solved the problem for humans, mosquitoes also transmit a number of diseases to animals and, for example, are responsible for the devastation of the native bird, uh, native birds in, in, in the Hawaiian Islands. And so I'm hoping that our technologies will also be applied in, in a situation where we can do something for island conservation. Anthony James, thanks so very much for speaking with us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Anthony James is a vector biologist at the University of California, Irvine. Well, Anthony James talks about the use of genetic technology to control malaria. Lauren, as a scientist, what is your response to the potential for that technology to eradicate a disease or even to change a species? The idea of figuring out ways to control the diseases by controlling the things spreading the disease is not a bad idea. It it's, would be huge for human health and human medicine. The r- things that I worry about are whether the in changing the genetic code of these species, of these species of mosquito, so that they're no longer transmitting disease or so that their populations are limited, what happens if that change somehow makes it into other native mosquitoes that are, are natural to that environment or to that geographic place and thereby reduces the population of those mosquitoes. And the reason that I'm worried about that is because many things on Earth are highly dependent on mosquitoes and mosquito populations. Biology is so complex. Everything is so interdependent. I mean, I think pertaining to insects specifically, the point in time when both flowering plants and flying insects evolved, there became this huge explosion of interdependence, perhaps in ways that became more and more complicated over time than they had ever been in the history of Earth, and that's where we stand today. And we're really at a point in time where we have this remarkable interdependence of life on Earth that's complicated in ways we can't even imagine. Well, what we've heard in the show is that uh, insects are not only interesting, I don't imagine that surprises anybody, but that they're essential, and they depend on us. Yes, some of them, like mosquitoes, but we depend on them, and in ways that I had never suspected. And even cockroaches are kind of cute and appealing when you get up close and personal with one. Lauren, thank you so much for coming to the studio and bringing the Madagascar hissing cockroach family. It was my pleasure. Lauren Esposito is an arachnologist. That means she studies spiders and scorpions and things like that. She is from the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Well, thanks to the team members who are faster than a cockroach scurrying under your refrigerator, senior producer Gary Niederhoff, operations manager Barbara Vance, and intern Anna Katrina Hunter. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the chemical history of Martian soil. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science entitled The X-Flies. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, we'll just buzz on over to our archive at bigpicturescience.org. Did you wing that? <laughs>